Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this um, presentation on animals in perennially popular uh, American literature. Um, we are unfortunately down a speaker. Uh, Susan Elizabeth Best Sweeney had a family emergency. She won't be able to join us, but we've got four great speakers, and I think you're really going to enjoy yourself. So um, what I'm going to do is um, uh, I'm going to show a um, I'm going to show a, a, a PowerPoint presentation, um, which would just kind of give you a give you a, a taste of um, of this project that uh, that we're all involved in. Um, so so um, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a book in the Integrative Natural History series. Um, can everybody see this presentation? Yeah, great. Um, and it's it's sponsored by Sam Hayes, Houston State University, their natural history collection, which is uh, which is the institution that I'm based in. So um, it's a book project and the book is entitled Animals in the American Classics, How Natural History Inspired Great Fiction. Uh, the book has just gotten to the warehouse. Um, excuse the uh, shameless promotion here, but um, the, it, it's really going to be a gorgeous book uh, and it's really quite inexpensive. Uh, it's $38 um, and with the discount code animals, you can get it down to uh, under $27. There are 90 color and 33 black and white illustrations. Uh, if you'd like to order the book, just go to the website for Texas A&M University Press www.tamupress.com. Um, so there are 12 essays in the book as a whole. Um, the, the, ones that, the ones that have an asterisk next to them, those are people who are actually going to be presenting today. So the first six are on uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Uh, Bill Englis here will talk about that. Uh, there are two uh, essays on works by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, The Murders in the Rue Morgue about the, the orangutan, and three stories by Poe uh, that involve insects, the gold bug, the telltale heart, and the sphinx. Um, Brian Yathers is going to talk about Moby Dick, and I think there's some kind of animal in there. I'm, Brian will tell us about it. Um, there's also a, a, a very a lot an essay which is a lot of fun on uh, the celebrated jumping frog of Mark Twain. Um, we have an essay on the Call of the Wild by Jack London, and Anthony Reynolds is here to talk about that. Um, the last six essays we've got uh, Steinbeck's of, Weiss, of Mice and Men. Uh, by Barbara Hevelin. Uh, we've got Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God by Serene uh, Sherrard Johnson. Uh, we've got an essay by Deborah Clark on William Faulkner's The Spotted Horses and the Bear. Another essay on Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea by Susan Beagle. Um, Robert Donahue is here today to talk about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And the final essay is on Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses. So basically what I'm just going to show you um, uh, a couple of images from the essays by people who are not presenting today because I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. So uh, here's an early depiction of, a, of an orangutan from uh, the 18th century. Here, of course, is a, is a, is a, is a photograph of, of a female orangutan with cub. Uh, and that's in connection with um, the, the essay on murders in the Rue Morgue. Um, here is the death's head sphinx moss, uh, moth. There's a, there's a number of conjectures as to what insects Poe might have been uh, thinking about in connection with the three stories. Here's one of the possibilities, the golden tortoise beetle uh, for the gold bug, uh, that uh, very famous and very popular story by Poe. Um, here is the, the cover of the first edition of Mark Twain's Celebrated Jumping Frog. Here's a really fun picture from the annual Calaveras County Jumping Frog Contest. You can tell this kid is really into it, and, but I don't know whether he won that year or not. Um, in, in one of the, the, the passages from Of Mice and Men, uh, speaking of Lenny, uh, we're told that she gave him all the mice she could find. Um, and this picture has um, special value for me. Um, 
uh, there's a reference in the story to the character Candy's old dog. Uh, this is actually my old dog uh, who's no longer with us. And he was, uh, he was 14 years old at this point and slept all day. So um, somewhat similar to the, to the dog in, in, uh, in the story. Um, in connection with our eyes, we're watching God. Here is a, uh, a depiction of uh, Br'er Gator. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a, another image here of um, a black family being attacked by bloodhounds in, in Haiti, uh, which is mentioned in that, that particular essay. Um, in connection with the Faulkner essay, of course, there's, there's discussion of spotted horses. Um, if you recall, or maybe I should go back to uh, the very first slide, um, this is the cover of the book. And the cover image is by Edward Shenton. He and, and it was, it was uh, done for the first um, publication of William Faulkner's story, *The Bear*. And so you've got uh, Ike McCaslin down below walking through the woods, and kind of the spirit of Old Ben the Bear rising up uh, uh, beyond him. There's another image by Shenton uh, that we also include in the book. And this is Ike um, having moved a log and finding uh, a paw print from old Ben. And he is missing, he's missing a toe. So Ben, uh, Ike knows that that is, that that is the bear's paw print. Um, here is a, here's a picture of an Atlantic blue marlin. Here is actually a marlin that was caught by Ernest Hemingway, who uh, actually uh, knew quite a lot uh, about uh, about not only marlins but uh, other uh, other uh, other fish. Um, and this is in a in a the, the Bates Museum in Maine. And then um, a couple of images, and these are really special for this book. The this is original artwork uh, by Peter Yosef. Um, and these are two um, uh, two paintings inspired by all the pretty horses. This one is entitled All the Pretty Horses One, and this is uh, John Grady Cole uh, on a horse. And then uh, this is All the Pretty Horses Three. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to get out of this PowerPoint. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm just going to uh, introduce our four panelists today. Um, First one is William Engel. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, the legend of Sleepy Hollow. He is the Nick B. Williams Professor of Literature at the University of the South, AKA Swanee. And he has published six books, including Early Modern Poetics in Melville and Poe, uh, that's by Rutledge. Uh, some of his recent essays include Fantastic Spaces in Poe and Place, that's Palgrave 2018. Poe's Critical Heritage in the Oxford Handbook to Edgar Allan Poe, 2019. Montaigne as Cultural Touchstone for Jefferson, Emerson, and Poe in Montaigne Studies, 2019. And Melville's Bartleby in Birth and Death of the Author, that's Rutledge, 2020. Okay, our second speaker is Brian Yothers, who's going to be talking about Moby Dick. He is the Francis Spat Layton Distinguished Professor and Chair of English at the University of Texas at El Paso. Among his books are two on Melville, Sacred Uncertainty, Northwestern University Press, University Press 2015, and Melville's Mirror, Camden House 2011. He is also co-editor uh, with Jonathan Cook of Visionary of the Word, Melville and Religion. Northwestern University Press 2017, and editor of Billy Budd Critical Insights, Salem Press 2017, and Broadway View editions of The Piazza Tales and Benita Serena. In addition, he edits Leviathan, a journal of Melville studies, uh, and, uh, and serves on the board of uh, Melville, uh, Melville Marginalia Online, uh, uh, Melville's, uh, uh, Melville, uh, um, uh, the Melville Electronic Library, and also Post Studies. Our third speaker is Anthony Reynolds. He's going to be talking about Jack London's The Call of the Wild. He is clinical assistant professor in liberal studies at New York University, where he teaches a range of interdisciplinary courses in the humanities. Uh, his research is focused on the relationship between pragmatism and post-structuralism, and his work has appeared in a number of journals, including Angelecki, uh, Diacritics, Literature Slash Film Quarterly, 
Q, uh, Q Paro and the words was circle. He is currently completing a book on exteriority and American pragmatism. Uh, Robert Donahoe is going to be bringing us home uh, this afternoon for us, this evening for many of you. He is a professor of English at Sam Houston State University, and most recently, the co-editor of the Modern Language Association's Approaches to Teaching Flannery O'Connor, that's 2019. He has published essays on O'Connor, Horton Foote, Larry Brown, Clyde Edgerton, and other Southern writers, as well as Tolstoy and postmodern and modern American science fiction. In 2014, he co-directed the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute, reconsidering Flannery O'Connor, uh, and he's going to be reprising that, I understand, uh, this summer. He is currently working on an essay concerning the film and novel, The Maltese Falcon, as well as an O'Connor monograph. Okay, so I'm gonna, now I'm going to turn it over to Bill Engel. Let's do it this way. We'll have each of the speakers talk in turn, and then when everyone is finished, uh, we'll have a wide-ranging Q&A. Bill? Great, and I'm going to uh, try to share my screen for the images. Um, and let's see if, if you're letting me share. Okay, and let's see if people can see this. Uh, let me see. Mm. Uh, it says I'm. You're sharing your screen. Can I guess my screen is not up yet? Is it? Uh, I'm seeing your screen, but I don't think the PowerPoint's open yet. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, so um, let me go into where it's new share. Um, Maybe this is what I do. Let's try this. Oh, I see it's downloading. Maybe we'll get there. I'll use this as part of my time. Hold on. Let's see. Here we go. Yay, technology. Okay. Now, how do I get it to do the whole screen? Let me see. Uh, Oops. Oh, we're not seeing it. We're just seeing a list of um, different documents. Oh, so you're not seeing the screen. See, I'm seeing my screen, the slides now. Um, you need maybe you can exit out that screen. All right, so you want me to exit out this screen and we'll try here. Can y'all see it now? It just came up. No, no, you need to All right. click Somebody share. talk me through this, please. I'm going to new share here. Maybe this is it. Hold on just a sec. Can you close the window that says animal panel? There, there we go. go. Is that got it? Yep. You got it. All right, hold on. Yay. All right, I'm sorry for being um, technologically unsophisticated. Uh, let's see if I can get it to go back. Uh, mm, previous. There we go. Yay. Animal Analogues and the Character of American Wildlife in Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Um, uh, John, can you tell me if y'all can see just one image or the title page? Yeah, we're seeing your title page. Great. Um, Ichabod Crane is one of the most memorable figures in American literature. Once you have a picture of him in your mind's eye, he's hard to forget. Just like the bird, whose name he shares in Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow of 1820, he is lanky and voracious. With an egregiously long neck and somewhat comical habit of high stepping to feed by the water's edge, the crane cannot help but stand out. The same goes for the itinerant schoolmaster who, without fixed abode, takes his meals now from one place and now another. And I'll quote from the text. He was, according to the country custom in those parts, boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers who, whose children he instructed. With these, he lived success, successively a week at a time thus going the rounds of the neighborhood, end quote. <clears throat> Ichabod Crane is portrayed by Irving, tongue in cheek, 
in lively and humorous detail. Quote, to see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield, end quote. This figure, one of the first great homegrown American caricatures to take on a life of its own, is overshadowed only by the terrifying and likewise unforgettable headless horseman, presumably impersonated by Crane's rival, Brom Bones. And I'm going to try to get to the next slide. Uh, here we go. There we are. And John, can you see the next slide? Yes, we Great. can. Brahm is a lad of spirit, characterized explicitly as, quote, the hero of the scene, having come to the gathering on his favorite steed, Daredevil, a creature like himself, full of metal and mischief, and which no one but himself could manage, end quote. He's known for his ability to handle and to be in sympathy with animals. This reference to the affinity between the master and his horse, quote, full of metal and mischief, end quote, underscores Brahms' compound double nature, an aspect of his essential character that Irving further signals by way of a most telling detail, and that is his cap, quote, in cold weather, he was distinguished by a fur cap surmounted with a flaunting foxtail. And when the folks at the country gathering describe this well-known crest at a distance, whisking about among the a squad of hard riders, they always stood by for a squall, end quote. Like the fox whose tail he sports, Brahm is an inveterate prankster taking on the totemic powers of this sly trickster, as well as showing his prowess through his actions as a successful hunter. <clears throat> this detail of what is called by Irving double-jointed Van Brunt's vulpine nature links him both to the animal kingdom and to old world legends. <clears throat> For the fox, with its identifying bushy tail is a venerable trope going back to earliest medieval times. <clears throat> Many social satires and jests or metrical romances involve clever Reynard tricking other anthropomorphized animals. Chaucer, for example, retells the story of Chanticleer the rooster and the flattering fox in the hen house in his nun's priest tale in the celebrated Canterbury Tales. The same theme is revived and repurposed by Edmund Spencer in the Fairy Queen, Book One, Canto Eight, with his personification of deceit and duplicity, <clears throat> known by the name of Duessa, who, when stripped of her disguise, is discovered to have a fox tail. Brahm's deception, of course, is geared toward achieving a more noble end, but it is deceit nonetheless. And so in excusing Brahms' misdeeds as merely youthful hijinks, as the community does, namely, quote, with a mixture of awe, admiration, and goodwill, end quote, Irving successfully blends new world woodland authenticity with old world intrigue. And that's a recipe for a great story. Throughout, however, there remains another important, although perhaps often overlooked character brought to life in Irving's winning story, namely the animal kingdom of the Hudson River Valley, which is ever present and in so many ways involved with setting the tone and also advancing the narrative arc. Mentioned in passing throughout the legend of Sleepy Hollow, this background character of the natural world embraces the many woodland creatures, as well as the barnyard animals and especially the horses. One horse, aptly named Daredevil, is well mastered by the dashing and resolute Brom Bones. The other, a self-willed, cantankerous old nag, proves true to its name at the peril of its luckless rider, 
miserable Ichabod Crane. Quote, he was gaunt and shagged with an ewe neck and a head like a hammer. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. One eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral, but the other had a gleam of a genuine devil in it. Still, he must have had fire and metal in his day, if we may judge from the name he bore of gunpowder. Indeed, the horses are recorded brief character sketches in the same way and for the same reasons as are the main players in Irving's drama of rustic chivalry, carefully staged against the backdrop of a bucolic landscape full of animals, both domestic and wild. The animals are an essential element in Irving's well-plotted American idyll that celebrates communal village life, hard scrapple field labor, and the rewards of harvest bounty, and ultimately hearth and home. Thank you. We'll turn it over to Brian now. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, one very happy piece of news that I have to share uh, with regard to the biography that uh, John shared for me was that uh, while I was at the time when we were talking over this uh, panel chair of the English department at UTAP, I am now no longer chair of the English department at UTAP. So if I have the aspect of someone who has escaped from a Gothic novel uh, and is now, you know, breathing the air of freedom, you know, you know why. Um, I'm just going to share a couple of particularly striking images. Can you see the uh, image of the boats attacking the whales? Okay, excellent. So I'll keep that up and then I'm going to switch uh, to Mother Carrie's chickens a little later uh, for contrast, but we'll just have this in the background for the first couple minutes. So Moby Dick is evidently obsessively concerned with one particular animal. The title is provided not just by a sperm whale, but by an extraordinarily powerful, beautiful, and confounding example of the species. Melville suggests that the whale that provides his title and the core of his plot may be the emblem of God or the devil of, quote, all that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brains, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, or of a gentle joyousness, a mighty mildness of repose and swiftness. The magnitude of the whale's suggestiveness and contradictions are related to the astonishing scope of Melville's own novel, which attempts to take in, quote, all the generations of whales and men and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. This staggering scope in Melville's vision of the whale corresponds to the role that whales and whaling played in 19th century industry and imagination alike. As Philip Hoare has eloquently put it, the whale was the future, the present, and the past all in one, the destiny of man as much as the destiny of another species. And yet Moby Dick himself occupies an ecosystem that is extraordinarily well-developed in Melville's novel. Eagle-eyed readers of Moby Dick will find references to Mother Carey's chickens, buffalo, polar bears, Catskill eagles, horses, dogs, geese, moose, the list can feel endless. This essay uh, will not provide a taxonomy of all the species that Melville addresses, but it does sketch some of the representative ways in which Melville approaches animals in the extraordinary novel that centers his literary career. Moby Dick offers a view of the relationship between humans and animals in which the whales show that humans cannot assume their centrality to the natural order, in which seabirds can teach human beings the true meaning of resilience, in which land mammals remind us that our human emotions are not utterly unique, 
and in which humans understand themselves through their relationships to other creatures. Uh, so today, uh, given the time, I'll use just one example of how Melville mirrors human emotions and animal behavior today, his treatment of birds in Moby Dick. And now I'm going to uh, make a somewhat clumsy adjustment in the images uh, that I am viewing here, going to, wow, clumsier than I thought. Um, going to Mother Carrie's chickens. Um, let me see if you're able to view this now. Okay, I am going to swiftly make the transition to Mother Carrie's chickens because it's quite a striking image actually. Ah. Apologies that Mother Carrie was a little elusive. Uh, you can all see her now on the screen. Okay, excellent. Well, to proceed. One test of a Malville reader's diligence is whether the nickname Mother Carrie's Chickens for the Storm Patrol is immediately familiar. Malville refers to these birds across his career, both in the massive novel Moby Dick that came to define his career, and in Clarell, his late verse narrative that is widely regarded as the longest poem in all of American literature. Mother Carey's chickens occupy the opposite end of the spectrum from the whale, in that rather than dominating the viewer's line of sight like a breaching whale, they can easily be lost among the waves. And I think you can see this in the image that I've shared. Uh, for a moment, you just see uh, the person riding the broomstick, and then you start to make out the birds after that. So also in Melville's text, if the majority of Moby Dick is devoted to close observations of whales, the storm petrel appears only briefly. In Moby Dick, Mother Carey's chickens appear in a conversation between Ahab and Perth, the blacksmith whose life has been destroyed by his abuse of liquor. And I quote, are these thy mother carries chickens, Perth? They are always flying in thy wake, birds of good omen too, but not to all. Look here, they burn, but thou, thou lift'st among them without a scorch. Ahab's primary suggestion in comparing the sparks from Perth's forge to seabirds relates to the status of mother carries chickens as birds of ill omen, which he turns on its head. As Richard J. King explains, the name Mother Carey's Chickens, as applies to storm petrels, might derive from the Latin Mater Cara, meaning Virgin Mary, the protector of sailors. And so sailors might see them as indicative both of peril and of the prayers uttered in response to that peril. Ahab also invokes something else here, the way in which the storm petrels fly just above the surface of the waves, skimming the surface of the water without being engulfed, to describe how Perth lives on the edge of the fire without being burned. One reference to Mother Carey's chickens might seem enough to last a lifetime, but in Clarell, a quarter century later, Melville uses the storm petrel in a visually sophisticated reflection on perspective. As several characters view the holy poem at Marsaba, the perspective shifts to viewing Rolf, one of the major characters in the poem as he beholds the holy poem from a vantage point at some distance from the other observers. And I quote, far down see Rolf there, hidden low by ledges slant. Small does he show if eagle's eye, small and far off as mother carries bird in den of Cape Horn's hollowing billow trod. When from the rail they lash, they bide the sweep of overcurling tide. Down, down in bonds the seamen gaze upon that flutterer in the glen of waters where its sheltered plays. While over it each briny height is torn with bubbling torrents of white in slant foam tumbling from the snow upon the crest. And far as I can range through mist and scud which fly, peak behind peak, the liquid summits grow. The image here is stunning. 
The oceans are described as a series of valleys and snow-capped mountains that provide a seascape in which the petrel dives that parallels life on land. Seabirds are particularly useful to Melville in this regard as they live in the air and on the sea, unlike those mammals restricted to living on land. Compare the above moment with the end of the triworks. After a philosophical reflection on the danger of giving in to pessimism and the corresponding danger of underestimating the evil and suffering in the world, Ishmael reflects, there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges and soar out of them again and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains so that even in his lowest swoop, the mountain eagle is still higher than the other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. The trait of the cats, that the Catskill eagle shares with Mother Carey's chickens is its ability to fly from seemingly inaccessible depths to wide open spaces in the sky. The Catskill eagle does so among landlocked mountains, even as the storm petrel does among mountainous waves. The activity that Melville admires in each case reflects an ability to move gracefully among extremes. For Melville here and elsewhere in Moby Dick, for example, in his account of nursing infant whales in the Grand Armada, or his description of the meat market as a site of murder in the whale as a dish in Moby Dick, Melville consistently takes animals seriously as sentient creatures with whom we share the world rather than merely as props for our own human drama. Thank you. Hey, next up we have Anthony Reynolds. Hey guys, since everyone else is doing the pictures, I guess I'll throw one up as well. Let's see if I can do this. We worked, I guess. Okay, so I'm working on uh, Jack London and I'm, you know, you know, he, we, we generally think about this text in relationship to Darwin and literary naturalism, and I'm trying to sort of uh, link it up to American pragmatism, which is hasn't really been done a whole lot, it seems to me. So here we go. In his 1903 novel, The Call of the Wild, Jack London tells the story of a domesticated dog who's violently uprooted from his sedentary life and forced to adapt to the punishing conditions of life in the Klondike during the gold rush of the 1896. Inspired by London's own experience in the North, Call of the Wild has maintained its status as a literary classic due at least in part to London's decision to write the story as a kind of naturalistic Bildungsroman of his canine hero, the irrepressible Buck who must shed his veneer of domestication and recover the instinctual knowledge of his forgotten ancestors to survive. Yet this decision has also made the novel vulnerable to critics who dismiss the work as unserious, sentimental, humanizing, and ultimately and often as children's literature. Such reductive criticism often obscures the way in which London uses the novel to advance a model of animal cognition that derives at least in part from the work of the pragmatist Charles Peirce, whose pioneering work on the instinctual origin of intellectual inquiry establishes American pragmatism as an effort to recuperate a sense of the animality of thought itself, right? Peirce is a bit of a weird pragmatist, but nevertheless, right? Rejecting philosophy's long history of denying reason to animals, Charles Peirce viewed thought, interestingly, as an emergent property of matter itself and thus distributed throughout the natural world. This panpsychism is foundational for Peirce's theory of instinctual reasoning, which he calls abduction. There's a lot of work on abduction. It's a very strange concept. For Peirce, abductive reasoning is what he calls our, quote, mysterious guessing power, our scent for the truth, our process of forming an explanatory hypothesis. And it is, for Peirce, the only logical operation which ever introduces new ideas. So it's kind of epistemopoetic in that sense. It constitutes the first stage of all inquiries 
and is considered by Peirce the very essence of pragmatism, which I think gets lost in later pragmatism. Within the larger architecture of Peirce's philosophical system, abduction serves as the means by which his emergent model of panpsychic thought expresses itself in both animals and humans in the form of guesses, insights, conjectures, hypotheses, and predictions about the world. Peirce's radical insight into the foundational role of such instinctive ideas in the practice of intellectual inquiry has enabled multiple generations of pragmatists from Peirce forward to begin, quote, shaking philosophy's dust off their feet and following the call of the wild, in the words of William James, in a telling reference to London's novel. His insight has allowed later pragmatists to recognize in their own thought something like, quote, the movements of a wild creature toward its goal, that's John Dewey, and to define intellectual inquiry as, quote, doing what comes naturally, obviously Stanley Fish, and finally to pursue such inquiry without method altogether. And of course, that's the neo-pragmatism of Richard Rorty. So reading The Call of the Wild in the context of American pragmatism, whose influence on London has been noted, it becomes clear that Buck's survival in the Northland is due to his recuperation of abductive reasoning, right, which appears in the form of a new instinctual awareness or, or literacy that he develops as the domesticated generations of his life as a pet began to fall away from him. Buck's reclamation of his animal instincts restores his access to an ancient archive of knowledge accumulated by generations of, quote, forgotten ancestors and inscribed or stamped into the heredity of the breed. Yet London is careful to insist that the instinctual knowledge arrives not in the form of a logic that Buck grasps by means of abstract knowledge or reasoning, but in the sounding of a call, right? A song that affects him corporeally and thus expresses itself pragmatically in the form of action, movement, recovered habits of ancestral behavior. Quote, it might be that he hoped to surprise this call that he could not understand. He did not know why he did these various things. He was impelled to do them and did not reason about them. Buck experiences his instinctual awakening almost passively as the accumulated knowledge of his ancestors begins to mediate his experience of the present in the abductive form of what Peirce calls perceptive judgments enhancing his sensitivity to the vitality of the living moment, to the tidal wave of being the perfect joy of each separate muscle, joint, and sinew. Buck's awakening comes at the cost of the veneer of domesticated subjectivity, which yields to the instinctual agency of the pack, the breed, and the species. A deeply compelling animal narrative and adventure story, Call of the Wild has remained a classic of American literature since its publication. And while the novel's contentious reception can be attributed to the tension between its popular appeal and its philosophical ambitions, London's deft use of this popular literary form as a vehicle for his inquiry into the instinctual rationality of animals brings American pragmatism into dialogue with contemporary animal studies, which is currently working on these issues. Um, it sheds light on the call of the wild as a possibly constitutive element of the American experience, right? And finally, it challenges our current assumptions about the nature of animal minds. That is all, thank you very much. Our final speaker is uh, Robert Donahoe. Okay, we may need to take the image off. Of yes, thank you so much. Uh, last speaker, no images. Sorry to be the person to do that to you, but uh, that's the way it's gonna, it's gonna go. That's what you should have expected from having Harper Lee follow Melville somewhere in that line. Um, I'm the one person who hasn't shown up in a Norton anthology and probably is unlikely to any time in, in the near future. But that's part of the reason that I think this, this book and also getting the chance to write about Mockingbird was really exciting and fun to do. For I would really wager that most white readers, and I have to put in the, 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 the modifier because I don't wanna think, I don't wanna 
try to think that inclusively, but for white readers who in America tend to largely encounter Harper Lee's 1960 novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, during their formative years, say seventh through ninth grade, I think most of them tend to remember it nostalgically. For while this realistic town, um, <clears throat> that the, for a while, while this re, re, re realistic vision that we have of, of a town in some ways may seem similar to Mayberry, North Carolina created by television's Andy Griffith show in the same time period that the novel's being, being written. Um, I, I, I think they're, a, they're able to be confused. They're able to be sort of linked together because both seem like they're places where things are certain, where things are clear. Children such as Scout and Jim and Mockingbird, they're innocent. We don't have a lot of questions about that. Atticus is a wise father. And most of all, it's a sin to kill a Mockingbird. And though evil deeds transpire in the novel, let's be, the wicked are punished. And the novel ends in a child's sleepy, sleepy slip into dreams where the certainty is that tomorrow will be another day and Atticus will be there to take care of us. Nevertheless, I think a close rereading of the novel can't help but noticing another note, one that sounded most clearly by Calpurnia, the Finch family's African-American maid. She says late in the book, first thing you learn when you're in a lawyer family is that there ain't any definite answers to anything. Now, given that the novel places readers within a lawyer family, the Finches, and that Calpurnius' claim appears soon after Tom Robinson's conviction and moments before the announcement of his death, there is reason to hesitate about accepting the sense of certainty that the novel seems to want to embrace and that readers love to find in it. My project in our essay collection sought to discover the role that animals play in destabilizing the certainty of the novel. A, a rich vein to mine because animals have a subtle but consistent presence in its pages. Not only is the novel familiarly known by the animal in its title, you walk into the bookstore and you ask for a copy of Mockingbird, that's what they're gonna bring you to, but its dominant family is the Finches. <clears throat> its apparent villain is Bob Ewell, and it's spelled with the, with the female name for a sheep. And its victim is Tom Robinson. Again, we've placed them in the names of animals. Even the central character, Jean Louise, has a nickname, Scout, that ha may have an animal connection, i.e. the horse of Tonto, the Lone Ranger's faithful companion from the highly popular radio program during the novel's setting, as well as the successful television series in the era of the novel's creation. Adding to this headlining array of animals is the bald fact of their numbers. My loose count finds 33 references to real animals, ones who eat, breathe, and move on the pages of the novel, and a stampede of at least 110 references to metaphoric animals. These appear in such metaphors as scouts claim that the weather in Maycomb is so hot that, quote, a black dog suffered on a summer's day. They appear in place and object names, deer's pasture, wooden sawhorses. Such references point not only to the ubiquitous presence of animals in Maycomb, but also to the murky divide between the human and the animal. The town's residents speak and act as if the divide is clear and certain, but their language, the author's tool, suggests possibility beneath the surface that is much more in line with Calpurnia's dictum. An early scene seems to suggest that this ambiguity is merely a minor satiric tool. Scout's first grade teacher, Mrs. Miss Caroline Fisher, uh, reads the class a story about cats, quote, who had long conversations with one another, wore cunning little clothes, and lived in a warm house beneath the kitchen stove. By the time Mrs. Cat called the drugstore for an, on, for an order of chocolate malted mice, the class was wriggling like a bucket full of Catawba worms. Now, Anthropomorphizing animals and chocolate coating their violent ways is, in Mrs. Fisher's eyes, sound education. But the children whom Scout notes are dressed in ragged, denim shirted, and flower sack skirted clothes and had chopped cotton and fed hogs from the time they were able to walk 
are in fact dehumanized by it, transformed into larval stage insects. But beyond the satire of small town teachers, this episode in its use of animals is a jarring departure from the certainty that this novel focuses only on race or offers a standard coming of age plot that we've all, all familiar with and don't have to think too hard about. The novel pushes this jarring sensibility even further when it offers three unresolved views of its titular animal, the mockingbird. These views stand out because flesh and feather mockingbirds are rare in the narrative. Twice, they are described as silent and still. And then near the climax of the novel, a quote, solitary mocker is heard, quote, pouring out his repertoire, plunging from the shrill key key of the sunflower bird to the irascible quack of the blue jay to the sad lament of poor will, poor will, poor will. But when the, but when the novel presents one of its most famous passages, where Atticus pronounced it's a sin to kill a mockingbird, his thought is explained by Miss Maudie this way. Your father's right, she said. Mockingbirds don't do a thing but make music for us to enjoy. They don't eat up people's gardens, don't nest in corn cribs. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us. That's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. So what is a mockingbird? Silent, imitative and loud, or singers to the masses? Naturalists offer a range of options, but the novel never resolves the question, which you could argue is a seemingly trivial matter until characters as different as Tom Robinson and Bob Ewell are described in mockingbird terms, thereby adding ambiguity to the understanding of their personality as well as our understanding of animals. Beyond mockingbirds, one other animal takes an ambiguous significance in the novel, and that's rabid dogs. When you start to read all the criticism, which was really one of the fun parts of doing this, because I had read Mockingbird, but never thought I needed to know the criticism of it very well. But you start to read the criticism, you clearly start to recognize that you, re you see that everyone recognizes the importance of the novel scene in which Atticus, to the surprise of his children, proves an expert marksman and a fearless protector of, of, the, of the, the town by shooting Tim Johnson, a dog believed to be rabid by every character who encounters him. Yet the novel insists on seeing Tim Johnson the dog in ways that question his rabidness, especially in light of the understanding of rabies during the novel's time period as a disease particularly difficult to diagnose and one whose symptoms are mimicked by far less deadly conditions. Driven by the fear of rabies, whose prevalence in Alabama, historians can tell us was growing at the time, Atticus and the citizens of Maycomb resort to the most extreme measures to stop it. They refuse to allow ambiguity to color or alter their actions, despite the ambiguity inherent in the situation. Such an understanding is key to the novel, since Tom Robinson moves from being a mockingbird early in the piece to being a rabid dog who is put down with rifle shots, just as Tim Johnson is, despite the possibility, although not certainty, of his innocence. Yet the novel does not even end with the episode of emotional racial injustice that is the killing of Tom Robinson. For the white Bob Ewell can also be seen as a rabid dog who suffers the fate of being disposable, of becoming like Tim Johnson, trash, pitched into a garbage truck, and hauled away. You begin to look at these, at these different aspects of the novel and you recognize that despite my love for Flannery O'Connor and her assertion that Lee's novel could be dismissed as just a child's book, its animals add dimensions of a larger social critique, a critique of a time and a place and a region that remains pertinent to our culture today. It's a critique that offers a far darker picture of the American South, as a place deformed by its very disdain for ambiguity, which its authors love to recover. Thank you so much. Well, thanks very much to all of our speakers. Thanks so much for staying within the, the time limit. Um, let, let me just throw it open to, to um, members, of the, members of the audience. Um, 
I, I see uh, I, I see a hand from uh, Martin and I see a hand from uh, SK. So Martin, go right ahead. Thank you, but this was applause actually. Oh, applause, okay. I, I was applauding, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, SK, is there, is there, Anthony, go ahead. I'll start. Um, I'm just curious, this maybe is for John, I guess, maybe more than anybody, but it's up to everyone. You know, having worked on this book for a while, <laughs> um, do you start to notice any larger kind of sort of conceptual difference in terms of how the American literary tradition deals with animals? as opposed to anything else out there, Europeans, Asians, South Africa, you know, anywhere. I mean, is there anything constitutively different about sort of what's going on in these chapters that you've been sort of working on for years now, I guess? Well, that's a great question and I wish I had a great answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I, what has been a lot of fun for me is how these essays relate to each other in fascinating ways. I mean, there are, there are some explicit references um, in some of the literary text, earlier ones, uh, uh, you know, certainly to, uh, to, to Moby Dick, uh, you know, Faulkner and, 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 and uh, looking, looking, back to, looking back to Moby Dick. Um, but, but other echoes, I mean, uh, you know, Bob, talking about uh, the, the, the rabid dog. And then we've got another essay on their eyes were watching God. And, um, you know, both of those books set in the 1930s um, in the South and, and, and rabid dogs playing such a, such a major role in, uh, in, in, both, of the, in both of those books. Um, so, um, um, you know, I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer, but I, but I do think that there is a kind of American, um, an American approach to, or feeling if that's a right, right word uh, about animals that you can see reflected in almost all of the essays in this particular collection. But um, do, does do any of the other panelists have some ideas about this? So, I mean, something that's interesting to me, and I'm coming at it particularly from Moby Dick, is the way in which mid-century we're having an emphasis on uh, animals as being uh, approached, on the one hand, as objects to be exploited, right? I mean, the whales are uh, the source of the lights, even in churches that uh, celebrate pacifism, right? Even Quaker churches half require the murder, as Mal Malvo puts it at various points in Moby Dick, of whales in order to actually light their churches, uh, even as uh, they're objecting to all forms of violence among humans. So you've got animals as a resource on the other hand, and then animals as being in some way, um, not just uh, comparable to us, but um, you know, being companions on the planet that uh, can illuminate the nature of human experience and which it's extraordinarily arrogant uh, for us to dismiss. And so the Grand Armada chapter, for example, which I didn't have time to discuss today, you have this comparison of infant whales with human babies. Um, and, and this is something that seems to persist throughout Malville's career. You get to the end, he writes this poem called Montana and his Kitten, uh, where he's actually writing in the persona of Montan, uh, but uh, addressing a kitten. Uh, and he's very amused by the idea that humans think that we're so special that there would be a heaven for us but not for, uh, not for uh, Montan's kitten, not for other animals. So it seems to me that there's a little bit of a back and forth between you know, bearing witness to a certain kind of violence in human relationships to animals 
and then a will to kind of undermine uh, the distinctions that are conventionally drawn that seem specific to Malville, but also may be representative of a broader emerging tradition. Please, Bill. You're muted. I would uh, say apropos of the Washington Irving, uh, the first in the collection because the earliest chronologically, uh, he's not quite to where Brian's saying Americans are going to be in the 1850s and 60s. Um, and both because he spent so much time abroad and is so influenced by um, a, a European Anglo tradition, but at the same time wants to um, transfer it or, or lay it on top of and let it seep in to something wholly American and native to the land, America's nature's nature. Um, uh, and in that sense, there, you're not going to be finding that kind of writing in Austria or Spain at the time. There are other kinds of movements, but there's a peculiar literary moment, I think, in the American literary scene that Washington is very self-conscious about and trying to uh, create something wholly new out of that old cloth. One thing that's definitely striking about um, most of the essays in the collection is uh, how deep a knowledge of particular animals um, the the authors or the characters have that that the, that, that that the authors depict. Um, you know, I, I, with, with Irving, I think it's just his knowledge of of kind of the, the farmyard in a sense, and all in all of those in, in all of those animals. But um, you know, certainly Melville, with his knowledge of whaling from from having done that, Hemingway, who was really in in many ways a a, a, a kind of marine biologist with with the the type of knowledge that he that he had. I mean, he sent species back, and and uh, uh, he was he was more than uh, or not only a a, 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 dec a Deep sea fishermen, um, and and just the um, the role that that, that animals that with that, that that horses and the, the breaking of horses play in uh, Cormac McCarthy's novels. Um, it's uh, and, and 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 again, I mean, with with uh, with uh, uh, with Wild, I, I, I with, with with the Call of the Wild. I mean, Jack London. Must have must have studied dogs and wolves uh, quite extensively to 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 write that that convincingly uh, about about Buck and 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 uh, um, so I I think that there is something very American about that to get back to your 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 question Anthony that this 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 deep knowledge this deep understanding. Uh, of the animals is, is something that I, that I think a, a lot of American writers, that was their approach oftentimes to writing, was to know a subject well, to know it intimately, and, 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 then, to, and then to write uh, to write a story in which that kind of knowledge was a major part of, uh, of, of, the, of, of the story to be told. John? Something I would just I would add because it was one of the thoughts that hit me as I was actually doing the project that turned out to be a dead end for me, but it was simply the, the process by which as American as America increasingly urbanizes our attitude towards nature and animals you know, it, it changes and one of the things I could see in Mockingbird is that the people who were most urban, if you can think of of make them Alabama as being an urban center, but they have the most simplified romantic views of, of animals, which I think Harper Lee in the novel wants to go back to something older, something that actually is more Melvillian. And that is a sense of the complexity of what animals are, the, mis the mystery of what animals are. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a curious idea that our writers may well have documented that either intentionally or unintentionally, over the course of the American literary experience. How about you, Anthony? Do you want to chime in here? Uh, 
Yeah, I just think, I think about my own project. I mean, you know, the the the, the fascination with animals. I think to me, sort of uh, to be taken uh, together with the you know frontier culture, westward expansion. You know, the the appeal of America as being a sort of departure from sort of you know European sort of laws and constraints and tradition, right? And so there's a, there is a certain, to, to use the term I've been working with, a certain kind of exteriority there. And what I find interesting there is that, that you know, Deleuze, whom I, whom I use a bit in, in, in the chapter, you know, he's fascinated with American pragmatism. He's fascinated with American exteriority. He's fascinated with, with uh, you know, Melville, uh, for that matter. You know, and it's interesting that these, these, these heavy French theorists you know, are, are really sort of attracted to American pragmatism, to, Amer to, to, to American exteriority, to, 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 to the whole concept that Deleuze brings up uh, of becoming animal, right? And I, I use a lot of this in the chapter. I sort of pulled all the theory out for this little presentation, obviously. But, um, but that's sort of the matrix that I've been working with in thinking about the whole project. You know, it's Whitman's, you know, I could turn and live with animals, right? I mean, that's the sort of the paradigmatic kind of gesture, right? We see this, I think, in Cormac McCarthy. We see this everywhere, it seems to me, right? Um, that's the, the, the appeal of, the, of, of America in some sense is sort of the incorporation of this kind of idealized exteriority within the culture itself in some way, which is both good and bad. And, you know, has lots of problems today, it seems to me, but uh, that's, that's, that's what's been on my mind. I was just curious how you guys saw it. I think it's going to be interesting when you, when you get the poetry together as well, it seems to me, that's going to be fascinating, the sister volume that I guess you're still working on, John? Yes, that'll have, uh, that'll have 10 essays, and it'll go beginning with Anne Bradstreet and um, going all the way to uh, Joy Harjo, um, ten, 10 poets overall. So that uh, I've just gathered the abstracts now and, and have a couple of drafts of the essays. So that's maybe 2024 that might come out. So that'll be um, animals in, in classic, Ameri classic uh, American poetry, uh, how natural history inspired great verse. At least that's the, that's the working title right now. Nice. Anyone in the audience uh, care to make a comment or to pose a question to uh, the panel? We may be writing about animals, but are, we're, we're not gonna bite. <laughs> Could be plants. <laughs> it's like my classes. You know, you see a lot of names. If you call on them, they're just not there. <laughs> Bill, I know there was a, another um, presentation on Brom Bones is part of this this conference. I, I wasn't able to to tune in for it, but uh, just looking at the abstract, it seemed to be talking about Brom Bones's um, insecurities. Right. Um, and you know, I, I thought it was very interesting that that part of your essay that that you did bring up about the the, the fox and and going back to Spencer. There it seems like that that might be useful to that particular argument that. Right. I, I will look forward to um, emailing that person. I was unable to attend the talk, but like you, I read the abstract and um, Brum Bones' insecurities come out right from the beginning because he takes Crane seriously as a rival uh, uh, for the affections of um, the um, most eligible uh, Van Tassel uh, daughter uh, in, the, in the little short story. Uh, to the point that um, uh, Washington Irving has to talk about um, Brom Bones had to use subterfuge. You know, he had to sort of do, so he's taking him quite seriously in a, in a warfare, hence the insecurity. Thank you, John. That's a great point. Did I see a, a, a hand from Theo Campbell? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't know that I necessarily have a a very concrete um, question, but that the uh, the other Irving the Irving paper about Brom Bones that was that was me. And I wow. it's it's interesting because I I was much more focused on the the metaphors about animals and as opposed to the to the literal ones. Um, 
but I, yeah, I definitely, I was, I definitely thought of Brahms Fox hat as, as connecting the Fox to um, Ichabod since Brahm hunts Ichabod. Um, but thinking about Brahm as a Fox as well is definitely, definitely something that I'm going to think about. Great, Theo. Thank you for chiming in. We appreciate your comments and it's, uh, I would look forward to emailing back and forth with you if that's something you wanted to do. Yes, Anthony. Who was talking about Catskill Eagles? I forgot. Was that Brian? Brian, is there something special about Catskill Eagles that, uh, that other Eagles, you know, I mean, I'm just curious. Well, I mean, I think the main issue is that he's talking about the Eagles being in the mountains, right? And so it's, you know, it comes right after his uh, discussion of Ecclesiastes, right? And he says that Ecclesiastes is the fine hammered steel of woe. And so the idea becomes that, you know, only if you're able to plunge to the depths uh, are you actually going to be able to have any sort of mature philosophy, right? Uh, someone who only looks on the bright side of the earth is an incomplete person. And so then the idea of the eagle, you know, soaring into the sunny spaces and then coming down into the gorges uh, becomes a material counterpart for that psychological state in the world. And, and that's actually, I mean, it's really common for Malville over the course of his career. Um, in Clarel, there's uh, this discussion of birds that skim uh, in uh, his description of Rolf as being kind of a modern day version of Rama. Uh, of course, uh, possibly the most frequently anthologized poem in all of battle pieces, Shiloh also uh, is focused on swallows as uh, they skim uh, and, uh, and swoop down. So, so over and over again, he's interested in the ways in which birds seem to be able to uh, transcend or at least inhabit contraries, right? And, and it seems like that's maybe the most uh, intense example of that phenomenon in his career. Nice. I do a lot of whitewater kayaking and there's one particular river we go to in the Catskills called the Mon Gap. It's just outside of Port Jervis. And this little river is one of these nesting sites. It's protected for bald eagles. And so it's just a little two, two mile run, class two whitewater, and you, there are eagles everywhere. And it's just the most spectacular thing. And so when you said Catskill Eagle, and I, I immediately thought, well, you know, uh, over literalizing. Well, and, and Cat, Catskill makes you think of Irving, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, what you raise about literalizing, I guess, brings me to kind of a question that I think maybe, maybe connects in some way to all of our papers, which is uh, the question of sound when it comes to animals, right? I mean, I thought of it particularly in relation to Robert's paper where he was talking about the mockingbird. But so I'm in the mountains where I see a lot of birds of prey swooping up and down. Uh, but also every March, we have a particularly loud mockingbird. Uh, <laughs> I, I assume that it's a series of mockingbirds, but uh, the loudness never changes that is singing right outside our window. And one of the things that I like to do with students is, you know, when I teach Dickinson's poetry, I'll play the song of a bobolink on YouTube. Um, you know, if I teach Frost the oven bird, I play the oven birds. Song. But I'm wondering about perhaps more just the sonic qualities of A um, and uh, the sort of literal characteristics that we can observe become thematically central in many of these texts. And, and maybe this applies particularly in something that's as concerned with epistemology as your paper, Anthony, right? Uh, where we're dealing with the pragmatists uh, and questions of perception. So I guess that's uh, possibly a you, you muted yourself, Brian. 
How long did I mute myself for? Uh, just the last 10, 10 minutes or 10 seconds, but no. <laughs> oh, okay, good. That's real. No, I was just saying that, you know, a sort of question about the, you know, concrete sounds uh, of animals or even observable behaviors of animals, that seems to me very interesting in light of, you know, the focus on the mockingbird uh, in Robert's uh, talk. And in Anthony's talk, I mean, the idea of perception uh, and questions of epistemology relative to animals uh, being so central, that, that also seems significant to me, right? Uh, the question of what we do with concrete observed realities as a way of thinking about these texts. Yeah, I mean, with the, with the, I mean, the, with Buck, I mean, he's, he's, you know, he hears the song of the Huskies, you know, and then that carries, of course, sort of the, the ancestral knowledge of the, of the pack, you know. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's very, very, um, very, very appropriate there, it seems to me. I mean, it's the, it's, it is song that is in some sense, the very medium of this kind of ancestral knowledge that sort of gets, gets, gets reclaimed by Buck, right? Which I think is quite fascinating. I mean, what is this, does this work out with, I can't remember if there's a lot of sound in Moby Dick in terms of the whale, is there a whale song? I can't remember. So, I mean, a lot of what we know about the sounds that whales make are post, um, you know, the time when Melville's writing. Um, on the other hand, I mean, there's a lot, not so much about sound as about the spouting of the whales in mm -hmm. particular. Um, so there, there's a very sort of embodied kind of emphasis, including, you know, famously the reflection that leads up to doubts of all things earthly, intuitions of some things heavenly, uh, is actually about uh, you know, the, the fountain and the blowhole and the spout of the whale. So, but yeah, the, the sort of underwater clicks, that's not necessarily something Melville <laughs> has access to. Well, we're pretty much out of time. We would have time for, I would think, one more question, if anybody, or comment, if anybody would want to, uh, to, to tie it up here for us. All right, well, let's uh, give a round of applause to our, to our panelists. And thanks to all of you for, uh, for, for joining in. We greatly appreciate it. And thanks to John. Thank you, John. <laughs>